We are streaming live. Attendees in the queue are now being let in across Canada and worldwide. Welcome to What's Up Wednesday. My name is Craig Mackay, your host. Our show today is about thriving in a green economy and sustainability with a purpose. As management consultants, we can be in positions of influence to help companies transition towards a greener approach to business. Our guest today is Dr. Yannick Baudouin, Director of Innovation in Ontario with the David Suzuki Foundation. As we bounce back or try to bounce back from two years of pandemic related growth or lack of growth or shortcuts and quick wins justified in the name of the pandemic and short term profitability, there may now be time to rethink these approaches. There may be opportunities out there to lead in a new way. Our guest speaker has prepared his presentation using Prezi, a web-based tool for creating presentations that we've not used before on this show. So that will be interesting as well. First of all, a few reminders of upcoming events. Thursday, Thursday is coming up or third Thursday on April 21st. It is brought to us from the Institute of British Columbia out on the beautiful west coast of Canada. So if you'd like to meet some Westerners, register for that free event. The Institute of Ontario will be having their AGM also next week, Wednesday, April 20th. If you cannot make it, fill out a proxy. They are on the CMC-Ontario website. Strategic Change by Design course is back. If you've completed module one, now's your chance to do modules two and three. There are still a few spots available. Have you signed up for the Catalyst 2022 conference? Please do so. There's a great lineup of speakers and set aside three afternoons. It's gonna be informative and fun. May 31st, June 1st, and June 2nd. I'm going to be there as one of the MCs. So I really hope to see you there. Rumor has it, there will be some cool musical interludes like we did last time. I love uh, a good rumor and a good tune. Uh, lastly, before the summer really kicks in, there will be a digital event on June 8th about digital transformation with guest speaker, Dr. Robert Wiseman, courtesy of the Eastern Ontario chapter. This is a bit of a precursor to the Digital Transformation in Government Conference being held in Ottawa, but also virtually on June 14th, 15th and 16th, yes, in the year 2022. Hey, if you're a guest today, glad you could make it. Consider a full-time membership. There are many benefits, such as a huge discount to attend the Catalyst Conference. <laughs> to learn more, visit our website at cmc-ontario.ca or cmc-canada.ca and find out how to join and earn your CMC designation. Finally, a few housekeeping rules you're familiar with. Stay on mute, put your questions in the chat. I'll go through those questions and ask them during the Q&A portion of the show at 1.15 approximately, Eastern Standard Time. This show will be recorded and will be made available on your YouTube channel or the CMC Canada YouTube channel, which we hope is yours too. <laughs> Welcome once again to What's Up Wednesday. My name is Craig Mackay, your host. Thank you all for being here today. I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous people of all the lands here in Canada. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land and to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to the land and our Indigenous partners from coast to coast to coast. Here in Ottawa, where I'm located, I acknowledge the Algonquin people and the Algonquin lands and our gratitude for the beautiful outdoors. It's also Earth Day next week. April 22nd, uh, actually since the early 70s, could be a carryover from the 60s, uh, they started Earth Day and it's been celebrated ever since all around the world by people from all walks of life who are concerned about making a sustainable future for their children. There are many events and festivals surrounding Earth Day. Coincidentally, this ties into today's topic on thriving in a green economy and sustainability with a purpose. Our guest speaker is Dr. Yannick Baudouin, Director of Innovation at the David Suzuki Foundation. He's also an expert on sustainable economics. 
His journey went from being a geologist at the UN to an economist with the and Director General for Ontario and Northern Canada at the David Suzuki Foundation. Yannick flips the thinking of economics and advocates a recoding of the system to prioritize well-being and the environment. He's helping drive a circular economy in this post-COVID-19 recovery. Welcome, Yannick. It's great to have you here today. All right. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm calling in from the traditional territories of many First Nations in a place now called Takaranto, uh, Dish With One Spoon territory. So really a pleasure to be here. And now the dreaded first moment that Craig and I were talking about before, me trying to share my screen. Uh, last time I did this, I warn you, the internet stopped entirely. I completely crashed it. So hopefully this time... Uh, it won't uh, cause a global stop in the internet. Here we go. All right, let's see. Thumbs up or I'm probably an unmute to tell me that it's uh, being shared. Yeah? All good. We're good. Excellent. Um, so, you know, uh, I'll give you a couple of disclosures first. So, yes, I'm an economist and a geologist, but I will not, and I promise you, go down the space of showing you Excel sheets, supply demand curves, uh, Pigouvian tax models or any kind of technical jargon. This is really uh, kind of a, an opportunity in this space not to have a super deep conversation about the technical frameworks, but really about the origin stories of some of our concepts and assumptions. So that's sort of why I'm using the Prezi mode because I'm not going to you know, be presenting tons of data, but more really digging into worldview beliefs and assumptions about economy. So I, I decided to subtitle uh, this talk moving beyond don't look up economics. I think you've probably all heard of that recent movie, Don't Look Up, um, uh, with uh, that I think uh, what Leonardo DiCaprio was in that, a lot of famous people. Um, and so that this is sort of where a little teaser, right? And, and also I'd like to say, yes, of course, I work for the Davis Suzuki Foundation. And sometimes that can mean a lot of, you know, oh my God, they're anti-capitalist, they're anti this or anti that. I'm not anti anything. So what I'm presenting to you today will be historical moments, facts, observations, personal opinions, but I'm not there to start to big battles. I'm there to kind of let's lay some cards on the table and see if out of that we can come up uh, as a society with some innovation and some novelty going forward. Uh, so that's you know, some of my little disclosure. So, so who is this person? Let's see, I'm gonna try to, to there you go, it's all working. Oh, this is great. Um, yeah, it's always you know, in, in person when we used to do this in the times before, uh, we could have some very informal kind of conversations, a little bit of, you know, kind of like water cooler kind of approach with everybody in the room, you know, maybe pull your chairs in the, around in a circle and say, okay, who are we? Who, are, who is all this? But all I can do right now online is kind of maybe reflect back on who this person that's about to talk to you and what my journey was. So yes, I started off as a, as a deep sea marine geologist. I was actually 10 years in industry with the company uh, Falcon Bridge. It's now <laughs> long gone. Uh, and then I ended up in the UN system. I was 15 years uh, uh, living uh, in Norway. And so anytime somebody tells me you can't do economics differently, I always point to the Nordic model and say, well, it's actually not a free market economic system. Um, so you can do it differently if you want to. Um, one little thing, if, if anybody in this room likes Brussels sprouts, I will not take any of your questions. So um, we can already put that there. But if you love peanut butter, I'll answer all your questions. All right. So why are we here? Like, why are we here having these conversations, right? Why are we here always talking about sustainability, environment, climate, equity, justice? You know, what, what brings us uh, in some ways to these conversations? And they're not new conversations, right? I've been in it only 10 years and it's been the same conversations. Uh, David's been in it all his life and it's the same conversations. So I'm not, I'm not saying that we're anything new, but we're stuck, right? And when I look at it, we're talking, we were talking a bit about the donut and, and how this could be the donut economic model. I'll get into that a bit later um, and how this could be some inspirational visual. But let's use the donut right now as a way to reflect the current state of things, right? We've had a, a certain economic worldview for the past roughly 80 years. I'll get into some of that history. Um, and, and basically, you know, it, it's, it's proposing that it's the most, you know, free, egalitarian trade, everybody's happy, we're all that. And what's really happening? Well, if you're looking at what an economy is supposedly supposed to do, which is build a strong social foundation for a society, 
and do it in a way that's actually, um, well, you know, and, and just do that, deliver basically some kind of a strong social foundation. Even with the most unregulated economic model in human history, we can't even fill the donut, right? So this is a reflection of a global situation uh, around some of the social pieces, peace and justice, you know, political voice, social equity. So even with this unregulated kind of way of thinking uh, and regulating economies, we can't fill that donut, globally speaking. And yet we've exceeded physical limits. So I like, I like it sometimes when I get conversations about people saying, well, you know, these, these planetary boundaries and all that stuff, it's not really real. You kind of fight. And I'm like, well, yeah, I know gravity, you know, we, some people like to think it's not real, but unfortunately it doesn't really matter. Gravity will always be. It's the same thing when it comes to planetary boundaries. We're exceeding these things. They're non-negotiable. Um, and yet we're still kind of repeating and repeating and repeating. And so what is that kind of way of thinking uh, of the economy? What has it been giving to us? Well, we live in a society with so many different forms of poverty. Now, we think all the time, oh, poverty is a money issue. And of course, there's so many different forms of poverty. When I lived in Norway, uh, I, I was working for a while in Fiji. Yes, I know. It was a tough, tough life. I was working in Fiji and an elder uh, there was talking to me about how, how much poverty the Norwegians were suffering. And I couldn't like, what are you talking about? It's like the richest Western country on the planet, like bazillion, gazillion dollars of oil. And they're like, yeah, but it's the highest suicide rates, high, highest loneliness rates. Uh, and they're absolutely right. So very, very deep forms of poverty in Norway. And so we weren't, we're not always looking at it in, in, in that sense. And I think it's important to sort of realize these are some of the net outcomes of the current systems that we have in place, right? It's not to say, again, I'm not, I'm not pointing at fingers like, anti this, just like this is the reality we currently live in. And wonderful Joseph Stiglitz, uh, Nobel laureate in economics, you know, you know, talked about it this way, right? These are all choices, right? Everything I'm going to talk about today, except the planet, everything else is a human construct. Imagination, people got together, designed, purely limited by human imagination. There's not one thing in that space that's non-negotiable. So we choose these things as, as societies. We also have ways of thinking about the economy that don't even recognize things like social justice, things like decolonization, reconciliation. N none of that exists in, in the economic model. Uh, actually, the reverse, you often benefit from uh, the negative outputs and, and the negative outcomes. So we're still in the situation where something invented 80 years ago doesn't quite connect with the reality then, and certainly not the reality of today. And then, of course, we look at the environment, right? I think we're all kind of uh, keenly aware that things aren't quite right uh, on the planetary scale. And whether it's climate change to pollution, to biodiversity, to overextraction, I mean, again, this is all choice. We choose to do it this way. It's not a failure of environmental policy. We do our best as environmental organizations to, to push government into putting band-aids uh, but at the fundamental level, it is a systemic failure, especially an economic systems failure. And I just love putting these things. I mean, here, apparently, this is the only reason why human, humans exist on the planet, right? Shop. And I'll get back to some of that later. And, 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 and this is really put at the, the emphasis of the exaggeration and the absurdity that the only way to have some kind of happiness and well-being is to get out there and fight for that next TV. So... A lot of it is going down to, yes, you know, you can jump into solution mode very quickly and you can try to say, yeah, well, only if we did this, if we did that, that's cool. That's great. I'm all happy for it. But I think it also benefits a lot from taking a moment, pausing a little bit and looking at historical pieces, because at least with history, you can't really argue. Well, I guess sometimes some try on social media, but you can't really argue that something that happened didn't happen, right? You can go back to moments in time and say, look, whether you, however you want to judge that moment, the moment happened, and then there were some repercussions and outcomes. So I like kind of delving a little bit back in that to sort of see, well, where does this current modest worldview, this economic worldview that we have today, where does it come from? Because then it helps to show that it's not some kind of sacred divine, uh, you know, law. It's nothing to do with the laws of physics or laws of nature. It really is just artistry and human imagination which then means you're empowered to change it. So the journey of the current economic system, and don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all of it, you know, about 2000 years of history, is basically the journey of one, the cognitive history of one culture. All right, so, so just keep that in mind 
the European Eurocentric culture is that journey. And this is the economic way of thinking that we have today. Okay, cool. So think of it this way. If you had all the paintings in all the museums in the world, all done by one artist, you think they'd look like all the paintings all in the world that we have today? Probably not, right? One artist alone can only have a limited amount of imagination. So basically that's sort of what happened, right? We have an economic model created by one artist. But let's keep it closer to home, 20th century. We don't wanna to go too far. So what happened in the 20th century? How many times did we change at the fundamental level this worldview, this economic system? You know, how many times? When people come up to, yeah, Nick, yeah, you can't just change the system. It's like, well, let me show you how many times we did completely change the system just in the 20th century. And this is just the economic system. I'm not even talking about anything else. So we start off it was a Great Depression. I think we all know that history. Wasn't a, wasn't a great time in the, in the 20th century for that. And then some guys got together, you know, at the behest of the president of the United States, said, hey, come up with a solution. And they weren't bad guys. They weren't evil. They weren't trying to you know, take over the world. They're just academics doing their thing. And then we ended up with the New Deal, right? Maybe some of you are familiar with that. The New Deal in the U.S. was a big thing, early 20th century. And at its fundamental level, it's a form of social, um, socialistic, social thinking economics. So very similar to the Nordic models, Norway, Sweden, Finland today. Um, so great. All right. And government has a role. Government has responsibility. Government should be part of regulating the, the economic development and progress of a society. Absolutely. Boom. Madness. Another world war. All right. That's horrible. So let's toss out social, uh, the socialist e economics and let's bring in communism because that's basically what the Americans had to do. And so the Europeans do build the material and all that. So industrial centralized economic communism, not to be confused with political communism, totally different thing. They're often brought together, but no. So that's now three times the economic system of the United States, the worldview, the model was changed. And we're only looking at 20 years so far. The war ends. All right, everyone agrees, horrible time. We do not want another world war. Great, that's a really good intent, right? It's not, it's not to have another world war. How are we gonna achieve that? All right, well, let's get a bunch of people together and let's figure out what's the best way, right, to not have another world war. All right, Brenton Woods, 1944, San Francisco, the beginning of the UN, 1945. There's a few more little conferences here and there, but this is what it took. So these people got together three weeks, a beautiful little hotel in New Hampshire, and did their thing. Again, the intent, how do we make sure we don't have another world war? And the goal, the theory came out, the more countries trade with each other, the wealth of nations is built, the more interweaved your society are, the less chance you have a world war. Okay. Now I always pause here for, I call it the Betty moment. So in the times before, I used to do a lot of these talks uh, around town halls, around the GTA, around Ottawa, just to kind of get a pulse, right? I had just come back from Norway. Uh, Norway is definitely not Canada. And so, can, you know, where is Canada? Where's, where are the Canadians thinking about the economy? And so in this Richmond Hill area, which is north of Toronto, it's not necessarily the DSF choir, it was about a room full of 400. And I was kind of going through the, this historical moment, right? These, these little group pictures, the pictures of the people here doing all this work. There's this wonderful lady in, in the front row and she's just getting angry or something. There's something going on. She's going to throw something at me. And after I showed these group pictures of the, four, the conference of Bretton Woods in San Francisco, she stands up in the middle of the room and she goes, they're all men, hashtag me too. And I was like, I could never have thought of that moment to sort of realize, absolutely, she's right. There's only half of one culture involved with designing this entire economic world order. And out of this conference, three weeks, the IMF was invented, the World Bank was invented, and the World Trade Organization was invented. And then the 45 conference was the UN we have today. So see? Just takes three weeks, no internet, no smartphones, and you can invent an entire world order. So what came out of it? Well, then a gentleman's agreement. You know, if you have goods and services flowing and factors of production and consumption, that's the world. And then you could grow that forever. That's the world. Cool. Anything missing? Well, there's no planet and there's no people. Uh, sorry, I mean, people. 
So I don't know, when I wake up in the morning, I don't think of myself as a factor of production or consumption. I'm, I'm a human being, I'm, a, I'm quite irrational. But this theory assumes that I'm fully rational and I don't exist. So that's already some interesting little insights. So we've become obsessed with it because it's a very, very simple model, right? All you have to then do is measure that throughput. And that tells you how well um, your society is doing, right? Well, let's, let Senator Robert Kennedy have a say on that one. I hope the sound works. You hear a sound? Too much and for too long. We seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community value in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product now $100 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts oh. air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances. They are our highways of carnage. Found special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts for the destruction of the redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder, the chaotic crawl. It counts napalm and it counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the fleet to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifles and spec knives and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud that we are American. I heard it. Yeah, so the sound was okay, I hope. Turned it up good <laughs> at the end, it was good. I think I know the guy. So. So just imagine that was 1968 and this, you know, basically that kind of discussion, that kind of statement is, is entirely still dismissed to this day, very much dismissed across our corridors of, of influence and power and our belief system uh, at a societal level. And so, so as the 60s evolved, and don't forget the inventor, the person who actually invented some of these things like GDP um, was the first to say, never, ever, 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 ever use it to tell you whether your progress or your society is progressing. It's only used for how much stuff you do. Uh, that's about it. And of course, what did we end up doing is now we're very, very policy-wise uh, obsessed with it at different scales, because I'll show you how it downscales to, to corporate purpose these days. So along the way, there was a, bit of, uh, a little bit of tweaks, but we didn't really change the system again. So we stalled in the 1940s and we, we entered that space of quote unquote free market systems there's never really been a, a free market yet. You know, Joseph Stiglitz was really famous for saying that. Um, and so, so I wouldn't even know what, what free market economics would look like. Um, but anyways, that's kind of where we, we ended up being stuck. And then you had these wonderful leaders who would say, oh, you know, there's no such thing as a society. There's just you know, men and women and that's it. And they're factors of production and consumption, labor force. Um, and then you had this supremacy, this weird idea that came out of the, the 70s and 80s that actually, it's not by law, it's not even an economic theory, which is really funny, it, even in, in the, the, the dead set, the, the centers of, of, of purist capitalist thinking, um, this didn't exist. And so suddenly it just became, right, because we, we got addicted a bit again to, to the, the, the profit motivation. And so we have shareholder supremacy. And again, I'm not, I'm not pointing at it as yay or nay, just this is, these happened, these things happened. And this is where we're kind of stuck today. So I'm going to take a little water break by adding a little humor movie. Hopefully you can hear this one. This is just trying to use a bit of tongue in cheek, a little bit of cheekiness to sort of explain this whole myth too about trickle down economics. So you probably all heard about it, right? We, we apparently the wonders of trickle down economics. And that was, I almost thought, but if something's trickling down to the masses, that means something flowing up to very, very few hands. So why are we talking about flow up economics? 
and, and its failures. So here's a little tongue in cheek little comedy piece from the Australian government. Hello, I'm from the Australian government. Are you confused about the economy? Unsure how it all works? Great, just making sure, because there's no way we could have one of the fastest growing inequality rates in the world if you understood trickle-down economics. Trickle-down economics is when we let the rich piss on you and we tell you it's raining. Like when we let billion dollar companies and millionaires pay no tax and then tell you there isn't enough cash in the budget for this stuff. It's all part of our SFA tax policy. Qantas paid SFA taxes for the past decade. That that's the spirit of Australia. Meanwhile, wage growth is dead and millions live below the poverty line. On New Start, the unemployment benefit, which even the Business Council says is inadequate, yet we've consistently refused to raise. Why should we? Julia says she can live on 40 bucks a day, and she'd know. She only owns five houses. But don't worry, ScoMo has a brand new solution. Bigger tax cuts for the biggest tax dodgers. Like the banks, which are currently being exposed as massive corrupt c by a royal commission. But hey, everyone makes mistakes and they deserve a fair go too. But if you're on Centrelink, we'll hunt you down with debt collectors, even if you owe us nothing. Because as News Corp tells us, it's people on welfare who are bleeding the taxpayer. P.S. News Corp pays SFA taxes too. Relax, banks and CEOs will find a way to trickle some of that wealth down to you. They haven't been able to name a single country where this has ever happened before. But hey, we place full trust in them. At a time when we also fully support a royal commission into their corruption. Think that's a contradiction? Nope, that's trickle-down economics. The best part about trickle-down economics is that the system isn't broken, it's not illegal, it's working just as intended, trickling the wealth from you to the rich and telling you it's for your own good. Trick economics, when the wealth trickles all right, just not in your direction. So it's always good to have a little bit of fun, right? A little tongue-in-cheek humor. And if you're wondering why I only show Australian and US examples, well, DSF is a Canadian charity under CRA rules. We can't be partisan. So I use all the examples from other countries. So basically to sum up that part, what did 2000 years of one half of one culture's cognitive history give us? This is the economic system we live in today. How quickly do you convert resources, basically nature, to money using the cheapest possible labor you can find? And that apparently is the reason and the purpose for an economy. So how do you bring that down and scale it a bit to, to the business side of things? And I'm always very careful to say business is such a word that has a big umbrella, right? There's small business, there's medium business. You guys all know this. And so when I'm more you know, looking at this space, I'm thinking the big, large cap multinationals. It's a very different reality for the small mom and pop business or the BIAs in Toronto. So it, it, that would be a separate discussion that we could certainly examine. I think just for the, the, the intents of making these moments and, and these historical pieces kind of show, I'm really focusing on, on that side of things. So I'm not trying to judge business. I was in business for 10 years. I was in mining exploration. I mean, I, I loved what I did. And so it wasn't, it's not looking at the people inside businesses, but understanding the structure and the coding. Right. So a long time ago, somebody decided what a business should be, what should do. And that evolved over time. You know, the, the, the way the old uh, uh, European uh, expansionist companies and they had charters and they existed for a finite amount of time, did their thing and then and then disappeared. And now we have this model uh, uh, you know, today uh, legislated in all kinds of acts, uh, business acts and things like that. So, again, I, I'm just pointing out that when we discuss purpose, business, sustainability, and all these things, we do have to keep in mind that there's a very, very simple code that exists at the moment. The form of incorporation has no idea what you're trying to do when you have planet and people involved. It just knows at the moment that the purpose, the why a business exists is profit. And I'm not, again, I don't want to create, well, it's not necessarily this, it's actually, you know, they're trying to be but the why remains intact. We have not changed the corporate laws to give purpose in a long time. Little bits of trickles here and there, but not at the fundamental level. A lot of what's happening in business today is changing what we do, right? What does a business do? Well, we're gonna sell clothes that are sustainable. We're gonna clean up our, our, our supply chain so that what we're selling, what we're doing, what we're selling is more sustainable. That's not changing the why. And that's where the paradox still exists. So at some point, you have to start experimenting with the purpose at the chorus level of what business is for. And as a little funny anecdote, um, I was talking to Craig earlier about a fishy story. Uh, I used to work in a project with the Prince of Wales when I was still at the UN, who had decided to convene 
a lot of the biggest global players in the fisheries industry, uh, also all the way communities in, in Africa, you know, developing, you know, so-called developing countries all around the Pacific. So look, we have to find a way to have truly sustainable fisheries because our oceans are dying. All right, cool. So we brought bankers together, investment, big companies, local uh, industry, cooperatives, uh, you know, um, uh, women leadership in West Africa, just all together. And let's have an honest conversation. What was really fascinating to see is how quickly it became obvious, even to, to the prince, that, okay, so business sees the tuna as floating dollars. That's what it is. And we still see that in the regulation process, the lobbying in the fisheries industries. You get rewarded for how many tuna you bring or how many fish you bring to market, not whether or not those fish are eaten, only to market. And that was an interesting uh, piece. Google at the time said, hey, what if we were able to help you, you know, change the goalposts of the reward system to fish to mouths fed? We have the technology now to do this. And obviously um, that didn't go much further. And, and the whole dialogues kind of collapsed. And, and I think that's still, again, where we're still stuck in this paradox of, well, that last tuna, when we fish it, it's going to be worth a billion, a trillion dollars. It's going to be amazing. So let's keep fishing it. And so, so our own founder, uh, co-founder, Mr. Suzuki, Dr. Suzuki, had a few things to say about that uh, a while ago. So the last little video of the day. Take the money and put it in the bank, you can make 57%. You clear cut the course, put it into Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, you can make 30 or 40 percent. So who cares what these people for? Cut it down, put the money somewhere else. When those skills are done, put it in fish. When the fish is done, put it in the food. Money doesn't stand for anything. And money now grows faster than when you conventional economics in the form of brain damage. Economics is so fundamentally disconnected from the real world, it is destructive. If you take a, an introductory course in the professor in the first lecture will show a slide of the economy, and it looks very interesting. Process manufacturer, arrows going back and forth. And they try to impress you because they think that they know very well. Economics is not a science, but they're trying to fool us into thinking that it's not. Economics is a set of values that they then try to use mathematical equations and all that. It can be a science. But if you ask the economist, in that equation, where do you put the ozone layer? Where do you put the deep underground aquifers of fossil water? Where do you put topsoil or biodiversity? Their answer is, oh, those are externalities. Well, then you might as well be on Mars. That economy is not based in anything like the real world. It's life, the web of life that filters water in the hydrologic cycle. It's microorganisms in the soil that create the soil that we can grow our food in. Nature performs all kinds of services. Insects fertilize all of the flowering plants. These services are vital to the health of the planet. Economists call these externality. That's nuts. So and that's a really, I mean, technically that video sums up a lot of the work that I do, right? Trying to find why is it that we're so disconnected? Why do we have a system that thinks again, that it can reduce humanity's value system to a set of equations? Um, so, but then at the fundamental level, it changes our stories, right? We, we have a system that requires ever, ever more consumption. You cannot have sustainability in a system that is designed to require more and more consumption and has hence production. And it's trickled into our pop culture, right? We've heard a lot of these references over time about go out and shop, show your patriotism at the end of a war. You know, now we're having conflict in Europe and you can bet your bottom dollar Europeans will be doing the same thing at the end. Oh, got to, got to help by shopping, by shopping. And so, so I think we're, we're still in this strange paradox of wanting clearly wanting. I've never met somebody who woke up in the morning saying, I want a worse future. I want pollution. I want this. I want destruction. No, right? So we want something that is very genuinely sustainable in so many different ways, social and ecological. And yet we're still caught into a belief system that isn't designed to, to develop that or produce that. And we've tried, right? Again, none of this is new, right? The SDGs, the, what was the difference between the SDGs and the MDGs? 
S instead of M. Nothing else fundamentally changed, right? And so we try, again, the humans in us try, but our structures and our systems don't know what you're doing. And they just look at you going, huh, what? I don't care. And so an analogy in a way you can think of it, well, okay, let's say we have an operating system on a computer. I have a Mac, right? And, and I'm running on this hardware. So the hardware can't be changed. Let's just assume that, right? The planet, you can't negotiate it. As much as Mr. Musk would like to say that we can move and mine all these other things and bring them to the earth, you can't negotiate with planet Earth. It is what it is. And then you're trying to throw on this, this operating system and this hardware, let's say, instead of an, a, an iPhone, you're going to put your Android apps on your iPhone. That's what we're doing, sustainability. We wonder why it doesn't lead to anything. Well, you haven't changed the operating system. The code hasn't remained intact for the better part of 100 years. And so the promises of that worldview are not just anymore in that space of, of the technical, the economic, the economist, the financier, the investor. They're really, really into our, our deeper stories of what we say. Right. I had somebody say, well, you know, in America, we have the right to, uh, to, to, um, to happiness. And it's like, well, no, actually, you don't. You, you apparently only have the right to pursue it. You don't actually have the right to attain it. That pursuit is a really wonderful thing if you're an economist, right? Because the more people pursue and pursue and pursue and pursue, the more they believe that the only route to happiness is buying your way there. Um, and then, of course, the better for your economy. And then our superheroes. Look at our pop culture superheroes. I mean, you know, I, I did this with some, some teenagers and some uh, university students not too long ago. And I said, if you, if you fundamentally have pop culture that says that Iron Man and Batman are really the amazing superheroes, and neither of them have superpowers. They, are, they answer, what's your superpower? I'm really rich. And I have no issue with being rich. It's the over-rich that's the problem, right? This over-accumulation, this over-concentration. And so we, we're stuck in this linear approach where, again, our, our values are as soon as there's trouble somewhere in the world on some, whatever issue, go out and shop and show your patriotism. And that's become something you cannot challenge. It is very difficult, even in my space, if I dare stand up in front you know, of some bankers on Bay Street and say, look, you know, let's just talk about the system. No, no, you can't talk about this. The system is the system. And it's like, wow, I mean, this is really a religion now, dogmatic. You cannot challenge it. And so to me, and now we're moving into maybe more of those new spaces. Well, what if you, instead of having that one painter from the 1940s to paint every single painting, what would happen if every voice, every painter was invited to that canvas, to all those canvases? What would happen? What would we come up with? It cannot possibly be worse than what came out of three weeks of imagination in Bretton Woods. It'll probably be a lot different. I don't know if it'll be a lot better but it cannot be worse. So I'll just move on because I know there's some, I wanna leave some time here for, for, for questions and stuff and, and these dreaded recaps. Uh -huh. So we're in the 20th century, man-made, literally man-made set of rules, like Pac-Manning the planet, woo uh, Leaves all our, our social environmental policymakers always playing catch up. You know, have you ever met a happy environment minister? Have you ever met a happy social or health minister? They're always playing catch up, those poor people. They can't, they, they don't know why they're playing catch up, but they're always behind. And so social ills, the, the rules we're supposed to solve, well, the rules don't even know there's such a thing as social, let alone social ills. Like I showed you the equations for how quickly do you convert nature to money using cheap labor? That's the rules. And so the environmental ills, well, if there's no planet in the rules, how could you ever know or, or recognize it is actually a burning planet? Of course not. And so, but what if, what if you decided, okay, let's just, just pause all our assumptions, pause all our preconceptions, park it all for a moment, just a moment. And we say, what if we really wanted a new way, a new economic way of thinking? What is the purpose of an economy? Let's just temporarily pause everything else and all the voices that say you can't do anything and say, okay, let's just do it. We're, we're gonna do a new way. And then you said, Let's not just innovate our technology, innovate our science, innovate our knowledge. Let's actually innovate our systems, our economic system. Because right now you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to touch or talk about innovating the economic system. Let's pretend that we could and we, and we were allowed to do it. And then you really center purpose. If you wake up in the morning, you know, you're 80 years on this planet on average, is the purpose of your life to just be a factor of production and consumption? If the answer to that is no, then should that be also the purpose of your economy? Is that all it's for? 
encouraging people to be factors of consumption and production? Probably not. So let's imagine we can get there, right? Maybe it is something that looks like this donut visual, the ability to take an economic model and actually merge planetary boundaries and social foundation to one powerful visual. And maybe what we're gonna grow forever is progress, not necessarily the quantities of well-being, the, qu the qualities for well-being. You can grow qualities forever, can't grow quantities forever. And we might get rid, who knows, of this gross domestic problem. I was uh, teaching an elementary school, not teaching, it was like br uh, bring an expert to class day, sixth graders in Toronto. And at one point, I was kind of showing this image, and the, six the sixth grader asked me, why would anyone want, to w want more of something gross? And I was like, can I have you meet the Minister of Finance for five minutes? Because that is the most perfect thing I've ever heard. And so is it possible? Of course it is. Everything I just explained is human imagination. There is not one thing that I talked about today other than the planet that doesn't come from our brains. And right now it only came from a tiny, tiny, tiny little amount of brains. What kind of business and economic framework would we come up with if it aligned with our real world values? So if you look at all the top pictures right now, you might say, yeah, so that's what we want. That's what our economy values. No. That can't be valued by our, our economic system. It has no financial transaction value. Healthy baby, healthy forest, plenty of food for everybody, clean skies, zero value. Having to pay to heal someone, value. More sick people in the US model, more business. More clear cutting, better dollars. You get a standing forest has no value, cut forest does. Hunger has economic positive value. You have to somehow spend money to treat it on and on and on. Is that how it should be? Probably not. So what is your favorite donut, right? This could be a new way of doing business. And it's basically trying to change the narrative and the story. Rather than these linear exploitative systems, you can be distributive by design. You can be regenerative by design. That could be a core business framework, an entirely new purpose for businesses. And there are examples, absolutely examples, all around the world at different scales. Not one of them has been able to attain the supposed holy grail of social and environmental ecological sustainability. The humans in these, in these companies want that, absolutely. I've, met, I've worked with Unilever folks for a while, some Patagonia, Chandos is amazing. But they're not at the ecological barrier saying, yeah, we're, we're finally you know, sustainable. No, and they can't be because their business model is still predicated on we still need to sell more, not better. So I'll end there. Um, you know, we're, we're starting up a whole new network of, of kind of reflection space called the Wellbeing Economies Alliance for Canada and Sovereign Indigenous Nations that we all can. Um, love for anybody to kind of start joining. You can take a look at the website where we're going to start rolling out some, some events and pieces. We have a, a dialogue with Mark Carney coming up in June. So we're trying to broaden the tent of conversation uh, to outside of just the environmental sphere, right? How do we look at this? So, so Mark's agreed to do a, a fireside chat with our, uh, our executive director in June. So yeah, so, you know, thank you from our founders. And I, and I hope I didn't stir too much controversy. I just wanted to put some cards on the table and see if we can have some challenging conversation. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Yannick. Um, really appreciate that. Um, got a good question here from Lynn McDonald. Instead of supplementing uh, the GDP, do you see any traction for wellness indicators on the horizon? Indicators, you know, of the commons, nature, health area. I mean, the problems are clear, Public corporate professional education needs a curriculum and then a real life emergent design process. Where and how do you see that happening? Kind of two questions there, but start with the, instead of supplementing the GDP, where do you see traction for wellness? Yeah, and so, so I'll, I'll say, so we've been working, we've been engaging a bit with Finance Canada on their quality of life frameworks. I don't know if anybody has seen a bit the last, not the, this past budget, the one before, they started rolling out something called quality of life framework to the budget process itself. And what's been fascinating is, again, they, they did a lot. It was, I, I'll give them a lot of credit, like 12 people team for like two, three years. COVID hits. We thought it was all going to go out the door. It, they actually accelerated the rollout. So there was a genuine intent to start realizing that how government operates and what its goals are when it comes to the economic policy is changing. There, there's questions around that. And that has a whole suite of indicators in there. 
And what's been interesting is through our, our little birds and friends and informal conversations with folks in finance, um, that framework is active. It's rolled out. Every department every year has to produce a scorecard based on those indicators for their, their budget asks. So the technical part is there and it's rolling and it's starting to be perfected. Has that changed the mindset or the belief? No. And that's the interesting element, right? So how do you eventually use a technical tool? Like, again, there are a bazillion sustainability indicators out there. I think you'll all agree. Some of them have been around for ages. The Human Development Index, the Kane Index of Well-Being, the, you know, the Quebec just rolled out some. So that's not a problem. Finding indicators of well-being, quality of life on multiple dimensions is, 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 you know, is, is, is a pretty common practice. Changing a mindset, a worldview, a belief, that's the hard part that's usually ignored. Uh, it, it's thought still that if you throw enough numbers and data at people, um, they'll change a behavior. And of course, 30 years of climate cops have shown quite the opposite. So there's something more than the technical. And so this is our next phase in that space of how do we support as an NGO, as a civil society actor, how do we also support government to take their own tools to help change that belief system. So right now, Canada invests a lot of money fighting climate change. How does it raise the money? By amplifying the economic policy that causes climate change. And then they need to spend more money. How do they raise that money? By amplifying the, the economic policy that causes more climate change. And then you can switch the words climate change for equity, equality, reconciliation, justice, all the social aspects. How do you pay for all that? You grow the system that causes it. That's the paradox, the feedback loop that is very difficult to change because it's still a thousand years of belief in history, right? We believe in extractivism. We have faith in a system we do not understand. So most Canadians, I barely can understand the, the, how the economic system works, let alone most Canadians. Right, and if you're if you're a struggling parent, if you're in a marginalized community, you can't be expected. Right, the the fact that it stays hidden uh, al allows it to still perpetuate. So I think breaking that cycle is not an easy, it's not a simple thing, but it, but giving it that attention is really important. Yeah, I mean uh, those are not emergent design processes. Those are, I think, what you're saying is sort of small, sort of. Uh, shortcut wins in trying to make some change. But uh, the second part of Lynn's question was, um, you know, the problems are clear. Public core professional education needs a curriculum and then a real life emergent design process. Where and how do you see that happening? Or how, where might that begin to actually have, you know, some sustainable <laughs> progress? Can I use the word that way? Yeah, and I think there's, in a way, there's two avenues here. There's two, there's a fast lane and a slow lane. So in the fast lane, we're having to businesses, you know, all the activities about trying to, to, to mitigate as much damage or negative outcomes as possible, that fight has to happen, right? And there are people across sectors in business, in everything that I've ever encountered, except maybe some of the shadowy money in finance, but for the most part, um, that intent is there. We have to try to not be as damaging. That's great. That has to continue. The slow lane is, okay, if we could just temporarily restart the clock on coding, what is a business? What is the purpose of business? How, what is its relationship with being an entrepreneur? What's the relationship with society? Uh, and start from scratch, right? That blank canvas. And instead of having one painter, you have a whole bunch. Would we come up with, a, 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 and there's some of that, right? B Corps are, are a different way, uh, perhaps, right? A different form of business. They're not necessarily, it's not about the profit side. It's about better, not, you know, it's not perfect by any means. But what I mean is but there's a lot of quality of life as a, as a measurement in a sense, right? Yeah, it could be quality of life. It could be something where the fundamental reason for business to exist is fundamentally different. And we don't really have a lot of examples of that. So that would be the slow lane, right? How do you sunset an old way and an old purpose as you sunrise? What's happening right now is you, you tend to have governments trying to have cake and eat it too, right? So we, we, keep, we keep the old going, so, so the very destructive approaches, 
and, and we try to encourage this new age of business. But of course, the mountain is so heavy, right? The, the old way of doing it is, is so entrenched in power dynamics, right? It's so hard to move. So you have this tiny little pebble going, hey, man, hey, I'm trying to get there. Get crushed. So I think, I think we have to rebalance that. Uh, you know, there are things we have to give up at some point. We have to give up on old business structures, old forms of incorporations, old, the whole idea of, of completely absolving of, of any liability. You know, where would that come from? That's not that old. That's only about 80, 60 years old. Those are things that are hard to talk about because as soon as you try to talk about them, you're automatically pegged as anti-capitalist, anti-markets, anti, 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 anti. It's like, we can't even have a conversation. <laughs> They're just words. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know if that helped <laughs> a little bit to answer, but yeah, that's what, well, that's just my personal feeling. Here's something that, that um, has emerged over the last few years. It's, it's maybe come out more of the younger generation and, and uh, the millennials in particular, but they've adopted to some extent this, it's okay to reuse and share right this whole share economy that's that's starting that started to happen before the pandemic uh i'm hoping that that maybe post pandemic this becomes um a larger uh you know area for for people to engage in i think that i think that it starts to at least provide some answers to reuse and sustain you know what we've already um built <laughs> rather than you know creating and consuming new things all the time well, I mean, I don't know if you, in 2015, Deutsche Bank uh, did an analysis of what, of all the different spheres of, of economy as a whole, right? So if you look at a society and all the value transactions, they looked at these different spheres and they looked at, okay, the GDP economy, what does that constitute? What are the kinds of, of things and elements you can put in there? And then they moved into the sharing economy, the caring economy, to start to realize that the economy as a whole, when you look at it as a whole, the GDP economy is really, really tiny. And so, and you can start to see what happens, let's say uh, Iceland a few years ago, all the mothers went on strike for a day, right? That, that's a civilization ender, right? But if, if a bank fails, it doesn't end civilization. But if all the mothers decide, meh, that's over. So this is the caring economy, right? That has no value. You only has value if you pay a nanny. So those are examples, again, of, of the absurdity of thinking that the economy is only the GDP part. That's so tiny in a society. A healthy society is much more econo economic value than what can be counted. So I think, yes, when you're looking at some aspects of improving the GDP economy, right? So circular uh, uh, approaches, reducing waste, recycling, absolutely great. We all work on those files. Because the moment you, you have to do your best to fight the negative outcomes of the current GDP system. But I wish, I hope at some point, my hope is we'll eventually have a model I never have to fight. You wouldn't have a David Suzuki Foundation. You wouldn't need a United Way. You wouldn't need feminist economists standing there going, hey, you know, um, you wouldn't need that because it would be by design embedded. And all of that is entirely possible. It's not desired by some that hold that power. And, but that's also a word we're not allowed to say. We can't talk about power. It's like, don't talk about Bruno, don't look up. Um, and we're still stuck there, repeating and repeating. So I think there's, there's those elements of as you're able to show people that the word economy is a huge umbrella word, right? It is about stewarding your home. And it, that word is only Western. You know, our unsustainability issues are only about 400 years old on Turtle Island, right? Since time immemorial, the economies of Turtle Island were ecologically imbalanced. I'm not to say romanticizing and everything's perfect, but ecologically they were balanced. Why is that? Listen to the stories that indigenous nations and peoples give us, right? There's no such thing as a separation of human and nature in indigenous languages. It doesn't exist. So obviously if your relationship is embedded, you have an entirely different concept of what an economy is. So the failings are on our side, right? If we're not allowing artists and artists and more voices and plurality to come in and say, all right, so for a couple of thousand years, you guys had the controls, you were driving the car. Take a break, take a break. We're gonna do it differently. Here's how we're gonna do it. And I think that's, that's what's needed more than ever. I have a great question here from Ryan Bates. How do we start to have the conversation about reducing consumption in Canada where our levels of consumption are 
uh, quite high. And where would we need five Earths if the world consumed like us, uh, where we need to reduce our material throughput by 80 percent, et cetera? How, how do you start that conversation at an individual and national scale and address the issue? Yeah, we put a crazy thought out to Finance Canada and say, well, instead of reporting uh, quarterly GDP, why don't you reduce that to twice a year and replace the other two with something else? And so something that isn't based on more consumption and more production, right? What is the quality? Now you have a quality of life framework in your budget. Why don't you report on that every other quarter? Those stories, that's the narrative part, right? It's not a the consumption isn't a technical piece. It is a story piece. Every commercial on TV, every advertising we have, every so much of, of government uh, messaging, again, like I was showing some of you know, right after the first Gulf War, go out and shop, show your patriotism from President Bush. It, wow, like, wow, is that why we live 80 years on this planet? Is this to consume? That's, and that's become a, a, a cultural narrative that is normal. <laughs> It shouldn't be normal. It doesn't have to be normal. Again, total the choice. So I would start with things like that, you know, and, I, and I, not, not to the point of saying, you know, oh, we got to regulate advertising more. I get it. There's all kinds of nuances in there, but it is a big piece, right? When I lived in Norway, there wasn't TV commercials. There were once an hour on the top of the hour and they had to condense and they have very, very heavily regulated. And of course, they're, they're a lower consumption country, but not necessarily because of a lack of ability to consume, just because it's not a belief part as it's still there. I mean, Norwegians are not sustainable by any means, but it, it was a different psychology, right? That it, I wasn't there to wake up in the morning and see how much I can consume in a day and get all the advertising bombarded. And, oh my God, get more. So I think, I think starting with some of those aspects, changing the stories, denormalizing uh, that idea that you need to consume more when you could be consuming better, the better part, like, you know, we've confused in the, yeah. in, in the, in our world, want and need, like nobody needs five TVs. You might want one TV, but you don't need five. You don't need it. So want and need are two very different things. What would happen if we focus more on want? I and we don't that. really have a reward model for, for sharing and caring, <laughs> frankly, nope. you know, uh, we don't. So here's a, a question from, uh, I'm going to combine two questions together here as, as we're winding down. Um, as management consultants, what can we do to become leaders in a greener world that reinforces our consulting expertise and is mutually beneficial to us and our clients? And specifically from Murray Chronic, uh, a management consultant here in Ottawa, how do we implement this new approach? Does it take another Bretton Woods for worldwide change or do we start <laughs> more locally or nationally? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll start with the management consultant ones. Again, like I said, a lot of it is you're already really good at what you do in the technical side. You know, you're advising, you're producing. That's okay. You're helping companies with a specific question they may be holding. Add to that. Add to that the story side. Like, add to that an ability to just, can a company honestly reflect on its own purpose, right? Why, why it exists? And do they have an ability to start... You know, it's not going to be Monday to Tuesday change. I get it. I'm not that naive to think that. But could it be a start, right? Could it, If you want that sustainability, if you want to be a good actor in the business world, what does that mean to you? And what does it mean to start saying, well, actually, maybe I should be allowing the lobby and participating positively to lobby government to change the corporate acts, you know, not be the resistor all the time. So dear company, as your advisor, I'd advise you to also get on this bandwagon. Let's recreate business for the 21st century. Nothing stops us, right? It's just, again, human imagination. So I think maybe there's ways in your roles to sort of say, great, we, we've done the work that you need today. Have you ever thought about this longer term view too? Have you ever thought that maybe your business goes in a, in a new tangent, a new direction? What was the second one? Oh, well, Murray had just asked, right, what, said, well, we want to become leaders. Um, yeah and make some change uh, after the Bretton Worlds, the Bretton Woods worldwide change, you know, how do we do it? Is it, should we do it, be doing it more locally or nationally? I, I think it's all, I mean, if we, so if we look at my, my background is complexity science, complexity work. So not, not even my economics is transdisciplinary. So it's not a traditional way of, of looking at things. So when people ask me, well, where should we start all of it? If your passion calls you to say, I I'm going to work in the, to, to do my best in the business sector with small business. 
And somebody else says, well, I'm going to be a climate activist. And somebody else is going to, all of it, right? Where your passion goes and pushing in those directions. So yes, all of those outcomes are tied to our primary operating system, which is our economics, not the economy, the economics. So yes, they can all be related to that. And in a way, it's a super simple model that emerges tons of complexity. So it's very, very, oh my God, it's huge. But I think that's where we can sort of see if you like local and you're passionate about changing a city's direction, do that, right? Absolutely. If you're like me, I love the macro. I am obsessed with macro meta economics and the big things. That's just my passion. Is it better? No, it's just, it is. Go there, go for it. So I think it's, an, it, it's just get that... Uh, Take on that ability or that desire and that, that openness to ask tougher questions, deeper into the system, not the onion layer, right? So what is it that drives us to be obsessed with simplicity, with unequal power dynamics, with, with a very particular white male worldview? I, I'm white male, and I realize that we're probably exhausted all the imagination that white males can do. And I love white males because I'm a white male. So it's not to say one or, but how do we start moving beyond that very, very tiny worldview? So bring so some diversity into your questions. thinking process, I think is one thing you're saying there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, 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 and it's not, I mean, to me, it's like, you know, I, I, it's hard to say bring because it, it makes it sound like I am the one that has to bring help create spaces where right. plurality okay. is cool. there. And, and it's not there because you're ticking a box, but it's there because it's fundamentally of high value. I'm I going mean, to wrap up with one question okay. yep. here and, and I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot for a one word answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm French. Yeah. We don't do uh, one word. Pas de problème, okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe it is. What's the most important sustainability issue facing the post pandemic world? stories the story the story yeah we're, we're like this you wanted one word the story but okay you know, we we are slipping back we're, we're not again the we're, we're gonna have a little bit of change but we're fundamentally going back to the familiar so maybe the word i should use is familiarity we're st we we feel afraid of moving beyond so we, okay, cool. we, we're moving back to the familiar nice. um, i think we need to get over our fear Bold new world. I agree. I think I think change is a wonderful thing, and we need to embrace it and use this uh, awakening to implement uh, some change that could be better for all of us. So, thank you very much, uh, um, Yannick, uh, Dr. Baudouin, for today. Um, I want to also thank uh, our CMC Ontario Events Coordinator, Sandra Addison Brock. Uh, What's up Wednesday is going to take a break. For the summer, we will return in September. I hope to see you all at the Catalyst 2022 virtual conference, May 31, June 1, and June 2nd. Yannick, again, thank you very much. Stay fresh, grow, and measure quality, not just quantity. Have a happy Easter. Enjoy your family and friends. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Thank you.